All right, are you ready for the word? All right, so tonight we're starting a new sermon series. Let's talk about relationships for a little bit, can we? It's been probably a year and a half or more since we've done a relationship series. We're going to title the next few weeks Heartstrings. Turn to your neighbor and say, Heartstrings. We're going to try to touch on everything from family, uh, family relationships, friendships, uh, most importantly, dating. We need some help, don't we? Somebody say amen. Dating especially, that's where we're going to start tonight. It's such an interesting concept in uh, the Christian world. And a, a lot of the reason for this is when you come up through youth group, how many youth group kids, like you've been in church for a little while, that, that's where things started for you. Okay, if you grew up in youth group, you probably heard very little about dating because it's really not great <laughs> for youth, right? Middle school, high school, we, we, don't, we, we advise against it. There's not a whole lot of great things that happen in dating in, in teenage lives. And those of you that dated as, as teenagers, for the most part, you experience the same sad things that everybody else did. There's not a whole lot of great that goes into it. Nine out of ten young relationships are, are crazy, with exception of, of course, Pastor Abby and Jeremy that met each other at like 10 years old and stayed together forever until they got married, right? But that's the rare exception to the rule. Most of the time, youth dating is crazy, so we don't talk about it a whole lot. But then overnight, this is what happens. You graduate high school, and it goes from no one has talked about dating and relationships at all to everybody wants to know who you're talking to or if you're talking to anybody. And then if you're dating, the question is, you going to marry them? When you, when you going to put a ring on it? When are you going to get married? And then when you get married, everybody wants to know, when are you going to have kids? What's that going to look like? Everybody always has questions. There's all this stuff going on. But we don't take a whole lot of time to discuss what's healthy, what's normal, what's appropriate in a dating relationship. Well, that's where we're going to try to start tonight. Heartstrings. Tonight I want to preach a message titled Healthy and Whole. Turn to your neighbor and say, Healthy Turn to your other neighbor and say, and whole. All right, Proverbs chapter 4. This is where we're going to be for the bulk of our series. And I want to give you a couple translations tonight. NIV says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. I love the message translation as well. It says, keep vigilant watch over your heart, for that's where life starts healthy and whole. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you that we get to be in your presence tonight. Thank you for what you've already done during worship. Thank you for what you have in store. God, I ask for the lonely person in the room, God, for the one that walked in carrying a lot of heartache, for the one that's gone through loss, for the one that's going through some difficult times. God, will you just bring a, an anointing for peace tonight? God, that as we talk about um, something as practical as dating, Lord, let your word penetrate our hearts. God, that we would be transformed by you tonight and gain five extra friends in the process. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. All right, I want to take you back to the year 2009. Some of you were pretty young back then, but let's go back to the year 2009. Let me set the scene. Things were very different then than they are now. In 2009, basically everyone was emo. It was weird. It was a really weird scene for a while. Bands like Fall Out Boy, My Chemical Romance, these were like the popular, you would get on your Comcast on demand and you would watch whatever music video was big at the time. It was a very different time to be alive. Twilight was the big movie saga of that time frame. I don't care whether you were Team Edward or Team Jacob. It really never made any difference to me. But it was a whole vibe. And it didn't matter if it was in the secular world or in the like church youth group. The youth groups of that time. Y'all don't know. The, the younger generation doesn't know. Like hip-hop has been the thing for this group. But our group, we came into youth group on Wednesday nights like headbanging. Like it was bands like Pillar and Disciple and all these bands. Y'all don't even know. I'm telling you, you, you missed out on a whole era. But I was right in the middle of this weird scene. I had all the black clothes. I had the big black Disciple hoodie that you wore every single day of the year. Didn't matter if it was 120 degrees in the middle of the summer. You were going to wear that black hoodie because that was the vibe. 2009. What a time to be alive. Well, back in 2009, I wasn't quite old enough to drive, but that didn't stop the dating scene from taking place. In 2009, 
A friend of mine introduced me to this sweet little girl, and she thought I was all that in a bag of chips. So naturally, we did what every teenager would do. We met up at the mall to go out on a date. That's what I'm saying. Now, here was the problem. Here was the problem. We get to said mall, and the plan was we're going to hang out for an hour, and we'll hit the food court or whatever. We'll shop and do whatever teenagers do. And then we'll go to the movies. And this girl talked me into going, see, going to see whatever the newest Twilight movie was. I mean, I had it bad, evidently. I don't know why I was saying okay to this. We get to the mall, and within five minutes of being there, we realize I was in a tough situation. Because I, I, now maybe not so much. Now I feel like I have a little bit of confidence about myself, and I'm somewhat in between introvert and extrovert. But back then, Pastor Caleb wasn't quite Pastor Caleb yet. And Caleb was very shy and very insecure and couldn't hold a conversation with nobody. And I was at the mall to meet this girl for the first time in person at like 15 years old, and I find out very quickly that she is more shy than I am. Oh, yeah. We we just kind of walked next to each other. That was pretty much it. It was a great, no, literally, for like 20 minutes. It's like, so how was your day? It was good. How was your day? Well, it was good. Cool. Well, we got a good thing going here. And then I'm like looking at my phone because now we've got 45 minutes to burn before this stupid movie is going to start that I don't even want to see. And I don't know how to talk to this girl and she has no interest in trying to hold a conversation and we're freaking out. And the worst thing ever happened. Oh my gosh. This girl had a friend that showed up and naturally to make her feel better, She's like, hey, come hang out with us. Did I mention the friend was a boy? That's a very important detail. I ended up awkwardly third wheeling. Dude bought a ticket and came to the movie. I'm 15-year-old, insecure, terrified Caleb is now third wheeling And I've realized this ain't it, right? Like, I've come to the conclusion at this point, but I'm trying to decide, like, can I text my mom? I'm like, Mom, I ain't about to come get, like, how do I get out of this awful situation? I saw the whole stupid movie. That was basically the end of our relationship. I don't know that we really talked much after that. But I learned two important things that day. Number one, not every relationship is the right relationship. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two, you need to be confident and whole as an individual in order to have healthy relationships. We were two very young, very immature, very unhealthy, very unput together people that thought somehow we were going to be able to figure it out to be together. Sorry, is that too hard, too quick? Before you try to be somebody's boo, you better make sure that you're a whole individual yourself. Got to make sure you have it together. Now, let me give you super practical. I told somebody earlier in the week, and if you're here, just buckle in. I'm telling you, just click. Get buckled in because I told somebody at the beginning of the week, we were going here, and we have only a couple weeks to deal with this. So here's, here's basically what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the few toxic things that I see that happen in young relationships that we can just get it out in the open. We can talk about it. We can deal with it, and then we're going to move on, okay? <laughs> oh, the faces I'm seeing right now. God, I love it. Okay. Here's a couple things that happen really quick. Let me start with the guys. Guys often think that they can earn a girl's love through being her best friend. Um, Counselors would call it a savior complex, a messiah complex. Here's what happens. Disney has lied to you. Whole, whole, let me tell you, Disney has lied to you. Here's what happens. A guy starts talking to this girl. Her life is all over the place. She starts to tell him all about how all over the place her life is. And something clicks in this guy's head. He goes, I could help her. And if I help her, she's going to love me. Think, okay, let's go Disney. You ready? Let's go Disney. Oh, you're not even ready for it. Cinderella? She didn't have anything together. Their love was forbidden. It was this whole thing, but all he had to do was find her. And he could pull her up out of this awful situation. And then she would be, oh my gosh, Disney's lying to us. 
Hollywood's lying to you, but here's what happens. Oh, I'm so sorry. A guy will stay in this weird friendship with this girl that will give him all of her time and share all of her deepest, darkest secrets, and he thinks I can support her, help her, love her, and she's going to reciprocate. And what's happening is you're getting thrown in the friend zone. Oh, God, some of y'all aren't making it. If I could turn this camera around and let you see like what people say, y'all are right here. I mean, you're like, you're literally, you're not blinking. You're not looking to the people next to you. You're like, how did he read? Did he read my journal? Like, what is that? No, I lived it. I lived it. Here's what happens. A guy genuinely tries to care for someone, but there's this weird thing that's not reciprocated. And it's because there's something in us, something that culture has lied to us about that makes us think that you're supposed to go find a broken person And love them well enough for them to love you back. And then everybody gets like healed in the process. That ain't it. Okay, let me talk to the girls for a second. Now, this isn't everybody. The boy said, thank you, God. (laughs) I want to be careful how I word this because this isn't isn't all women. So let's say from a cultural standpoint, okay. For a cultural standpoint, girls play into the exact same lie that I need to be saved, that I need someone to see me, to tell me that I'm great, to speak that over me, to speak. And you get caught in this weird, this weird spot, and it happens to men too, but specifically with women, where you will stay in an unhealthy, abusive spot because you think that that's normal. Man, this is tough. Who wrote this? Both sides will lower our expectations and standards because we genuinely don't believe that we're worthy of something great. You're worthy of something great. So let, me, let me calm down for a minute. We hit you with a shotgun. Let's chill out. You are worthy of something wonderful. You are worthy of a healthy relationship, and you deserve to be a whole and healthy individual that can step into a whole and healthy relationship. Because this is the lie. This is the lie of culture right now. I guess it's been this way for a while, but gosh, it's so true right now. One of the most famous like chick flick love scenes is where the, the guy says, you complete me. It's ridiculous. That's not how this works. That's not how this works. It's not... I am 80% of an individual and God has prepared the other 20% that's going to help me be happy and peaceful and whole. That is not biblical. That is not God's plan for you. That is not how this thing is going to work. You can be a happy and whole person without a significant other. You don't need a significant other to be whole. You do not need a significant other to be a whole human. Okay? Look at this in scripture. Genesis chapter 2 says, So the man gave names to all the livestock. This is right after God has created Adam. He's about to create Eve. It says the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of man and brought her to the man. We, for years, have shared this scripture in weddings. Anybody ever heard this in a wedding? Happens all the time. And this is the angle. It's like, well, Adam was missing his rib. But the Lord God brought the good thing, brought the blessing, and now he is whole again. Hold up. Time out. God did not say that Adam was broken or that God was incomplete So he was going to change things to give him a spouse. He said there was no helper suitable for him. That is a completely different thing. There is a huge difference between I am unhappy, I am unfulfilled, I don't know who I am, I can't exist in the world, I have to have someone to come complete me. That's a very different thing than God has given me a purpose and a calling on earth and he's going to give me a partner to complete that purpose with. There are two completely different things. 
A relationship is not about becoming a complete individual. It's about having a team member to complete your calling with. God gave Adam a job. Then he gave him a partner. The problem is we have unhealthy relationships. This is the the core of everything, okay? And this is where you're like, thanks, Pastor Caleb. It's mind-boggling. I never would have thought of that. But we have unhealthy relationships because we are unhealthy individuals. We expect to step into this relationship, to step into this thing, and our friendships are the same. We expect to have some friend that's just going to hold us up when things are tough and be there through all the hard times, right? And you think that you're going to complete each other and everything's going to magically make sense. And that's not how this works. Friendship is so important. Relationships are so important. And God is so good that he will put people in your life that will hold you up when you're having a tough day. But there is something that, that gets in our mindset that we have to have it. That like this, the way this whole thing was created somehow was that it had to be deeply intertwined. And if we don't have all the puzzle pieces in the right spot, we're never going to be happy. We're never going to be fulfilled. We're never going to be whatever. That's not biblical. God is the ultimate provider, the ultimate caregiver, and the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And we have to get to a place where we are healthy enough to have something to offer to a relationship. So that that teammate, that partner, that spouse that you're praying for, you want to be in a healthy enough place so that you can link arms with that person for this purpose. So that they can help you fulfill what God called you to do and so that you can help them fulfill what God has called them to do. Praise God. That's good preaching. Appreciate it. Here's what happens practically. Oh gosh, I love it. I'm sorry, not sorry. Here's a couple examples of what happens when we run into relationships unhealthy. We have friendships. Let's go friendships first. We have friendships without boundaries. Here's my personal opinion, okay? Take it or leave it, whatever. I'm right, but that's fine. My personal opinion is that there is no such thing as male and female like best friends. It only happens in a marriage. Only happens in a marriage. Uh, Because of the example that I gave earlier, what happens is you have this relationship, this friendship that turns into something where you are sharing your deepest, darkest secrets. You stay up in the middle of the night texting somebody, telling them about, oh, what happened to me, the abuse that I went through, the drama that I went through, the heartache that I've been through. And you know what happens? It feels great because you finally have somebody that semi like feels that friendship Thing that's supposed to happen in marriage. It, it's supposed to happen in marriage. But when we don't have boundaries in place, it innocently enough, we can so, oh, so simply find ourselves in a place where we have shared everything with an individual without having to commit to being in a relationship with them. Do you know what that's called? A friend with benefits. We always think of that as physical. It's not. Here, I can prove it. If you are a married person, hear me, if you are a married individual, if I decided to text a female all the time and tell her how hard my life is, how much I'm going through, and she's praying for me and we're in each other's corner, you know what that would be called? An emotional affair. And it happens. Generally, before an affair gets physical, it starts emotional. So if it can happen in that context, it absolutely happens as a single person. And the friend zone, it's a real thing. But nine times out of ten, it started with just this friend. And listen, I ain't here to throw shots at anybody. I lived this more than once because I was just a dumb teenager, evidently, and into my early 20s. I was just dumb. And I had, I remember one of my best friends for a while coming up through high school was a girl. And we had the terrible habit of what some of you have maybe experienced. We would just put it on speakerphone and talk until all hours of the night and fall asleep on the phone. Like that was totally normal. Let me tell you, at 29, that's not normal. That's not healthy. And do you know what happened? Eventually, one of us caught feelings and it wasn't mutual. And now we're in this really uh, in-between And we hardly, that was it. That was the end of the friendship. That was pretty much it. I lived that experience more than once. 
I saw both ends where I caught feelings or the girl caught feelings. And there was this weird like emotional relationship without actually having to be in a dating relationship. Y'all have never dealt with anything like this. But for me, I had to figure out how to just calm down enough to let God be my peace and to step back enough to process, okay, if I'm literally in need of these constant conversations to cope with what I'm going through, you know what that means about me? It means I'm unhealthy. It means I have bad habits that I've got to figure out. And what will you do, for those of you that are currently in that situation, and it may not be anybody in the room, but I have watched it happen with people that have been good, legitimate good friends that never did catch feelings for each other, that would just talk three or four days a week, text all the time, stay up late and talk. What do you do if you're in that position and God sends you the spouse you've been praying for? You're going, homie, you're going to try to tell me that you're going to tell your, your future wife, hey, I love you, I'm fully committed to you, but twice a week at one in the morning, I have to go call her. I have to go tell her how it's been and how hard things are going on. No, what happens is the whole friendship gets cut off. You rip the Band-Aid off, you never talk to that person anymore. Because God didn't intend for you to be in this emotional relationship thing with someone of the opposite gender that's not your spouse. There's a natural aspect of that that happens when you date, okay? Dating is a different caveat, and we'll we'll get into that in the next couple of weeks. But dating is an evaluation period. It's where you start trying to figure out, is this somebody I could see myself spending my life with, hanging out with, doing what? Can we actually be friends, right? And over time, you start to realize whether or not that could work. But naturally, when you spend time with people, those emotions start to happen and you start to share your stories and you start to. There's a place for that that's healthy in the right context. But even then, there are boundaries that should be there. Because when you get married, There's a covenant thing that changes and a blessing that's poured out over over your home. And you want to be able to fully step into everything that that looks like without having all this emotional connection with other people. We talk about sex. We talk about the physical things that come along with it and how you don't want to just get all over the place and have to carry the baggage that comes along with it. But y'all, it's emotional as much as it's physical. And it's so easy to get in these friendships, not even dating, but friendships that can be so detrimental in the long run. The second thing that I see that happens quite a bit, and this one I really want to be careful with, um, is let's throw it on Disney again, okay? There is something, like for whatever reason, there's something attractive about forbidden love. Think about how many movies, even into that like Disney princess world, like uh, like Little Mermaid kind of thing, where it was like, oh, it was never supposed to happen. Ariel was never supposed to get to land. She was never supposed to be with him, but they beat all the odds, right? Like, and it paints this beautiful thing that's a wonderful story and it makes for a great movie. You look at Romeo and Juliet. And they're like, oh, we just love each other so much and our parents hate it and whatever. Like this big dramatic nonsense that ends poorly for everybody. Hear me. There are a few circumstances where God might be doing something in your life for your future spouse that maybe not everybody understands. That not all the families on board with That not everybody. But there is a huge red flag. If everybody in your life thinks your relationship is toxic. But we we diminish that because there's something attractive about forbidden love. And we go, oh, you just don't understand. I can change him. You're crazy. Because that goes back to where we started. He don't need you to change him. And you're not his savior. You need to be a whole healthy individual and he needs to be a whole healthy individual and you both can land in a good spot where you can make each other happy and you can live together and all the dreams can come true. But there is this lie that romanticizes something really, really difficult. Hear me. You do not want to spend the rest of your life trying to prove that your relationship is good to everybody else. 
And this is what happens. People will stay in an unhealthy, toxic relationship because their parents told them ahead of time and they just want to prove that they were right. They were like, hell or high water, I'm sticking this thing out because I felt like God said this and I felt like this is where I'm supposed to go and who cares if he's abusive? Who cares if she's cheating on me? Who cares if all this stuff? Stop! You are a child of God. You deserve a healthy, good marriage. If you don't hear anything else, stop lowering your standards and stop acting like somebody that's not good enough for the person you're praying that God is going to bring to you. Let's focus on getting our own priorities straight, becoming healthy and whole so that we can walk in the marriage that we believe God is going to bring us. Somebody say amen. Amen. Okay, here's all the things. Let's get to the word. Somebody said, praise God, I need the Bible. John chapter 4. It's one of our favorite scriptures. We, we land here all the time in Oasis. Jesus is traveling and he comes through Samaria and he stops at this well and has this whole conversation with this woman. He asks her to, to draw some water from the well for him to drink. If you've been here for a little while, you've heard me preach it and I won't get caught up in the weeds of why that was weird culturally at that time or all of what was going on. But they get to a point in the conversation where Jesus says to her, if you knew who you were talking to, If you knew who you were face to face with, you would ask me for living water and you would never thirst again. And this is her response in verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite right. Whew. Yeah, if you're reading that for the first time, you're like, whoo, man, all right. Jerry Springer, okay. (laughs) On paper, it seems like this really intense, like rip the Band-Aid off. And you read the whole story through, and in a lot of ways, you go, why is that even significant? There's a lot of power in the fact that he told her everything she had been through. But of all the things he could have called out, couldn't he have said, like, (laughs) you can drink from living water that will make you healthy and make you whole like when you broke your ankle at 13. Like there's all this backstory he could have brought up to bring up the fact that this woman has had five husbands and her current man ain't even the one she's married to and all the awkwardness of all of that, all the things that stirs up. I point that out tonight because he tells her, you're asking for living water now so that you won't thirst again. You have got to learn at some point that relationships are not going to fulfill this longing you have. You can be married and unhappy. You can be married and lonely. You can be married and still struggling with porn and other addictions. You can be married and still not yet where you want to go. Relationships was not this woman's problem. She's unsatisfied because she's unhealthy. I spent a lot of my life unhealthy. So here, big brother Caleb say, don't don't play that game. Don't waste the time trying to find the person that will fulfill you, complete you. Listen, set your standards in a good place, run your race, and let God figure the rest out. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Date, get yourself out there. Guys, shoot your shot. Don't do this stupid friend zone stuff anymore. If she says no, move on. You're welcome. But we can't stay in this awkward in-between trying to figure out because relationships are not what's going to fix the issue that you have. Let me encourage you with this tonight. Look at how the, the story ends in verse 25. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming and when he comes he will explain everything to us. Well then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. You need to understand how big of a deal this is. Do you know how many times in Scripture people asked Jesus about who he was? That was the big issue, was he was claiming at times to be God, to be the Son of God. And they, were, they crucified him for it eventually. Like, this was the big issue. And because of that, there were many, many times when he would not give a direct answer. In fact, the majority of the time, he didn't say, oh yes, here I am, the Messiah. He let people to talk and discuss and to have faith and to process through. With the disciples, he asked them, who do you say that I am? But with this woman, he says, I am 
the Messiah. One of the deepest revelations of Scripture happened to this woman in one of her loneliest seasons. Jesus tells her, relationships are not going to fix your issues. You've had all of these awful experiences. You've had all these ex-husbands. You've got all this drama. You've got all this stuff, and that's awful. But what you need is living water. By the way, here's something about me that I've told very few people. Here's something about me that you can cling to. Here's a revelation of who I am and how much I can change your life that maybe not everybody's caught on to yet. Some of the deepest, most meaningful moments in your faith will happen when you are single. Some of the most incredible downloads from the Lord will happen when it's just you complaining to the Lord that you're not married yet. I'm telling you, when you will get alone and there's not the noise and the distraction and all the stuff, when you can just be single and be trying to figure it out and get honest with the Lord about where you're at and how you feel about these things, when you will admit the loneliness, admit the situation, get real with Him about where you are at, it's in those moments that some of my deepest interactions with God took place. So when you're in the waiting, when you're in the the in-between, press into His Spirit. Allow him to give you living water. Living water. Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. And again, because the message translation is so good. Keep vigilant watch. That's the whole point for tonight. Even in your friendships, are you protecting this thing? Not just for you, but for your future spouse, for your future kids. Are you protecting the culture of what's going to be your home one day? Young men, go ahead and be the priest of your house. Get it in your head. You you get to carry that. That's a mantle you're going to get to carry one day. Go ahead and live in it. Act like it. What do I want the atmosphere of my home to feel like? Do I want it to be a pessimistic, toxic, awful place to be? Am I just going to come home and fuss and cuss about everything every day? Or am I going to turn worship music on and let this place be joyful? How do I want to live my life? What decisions can I make right now to keep vigilant watch over my heart? Because that's where everything else flows from. If you want to have healthy relationships, church, you have to be healthy and whole as an individual first. You will never have it all together. You will, you will stand on your wedding day one day and be like, oh, God, I'm not ready. Like, okay, there's an aspect of that that is normal and that is okay. You will never feel like you're completely, this people told me growing up, you'll never feel like you're completely ready to be married. You'll never feel like you're completely ready to be a parent. I've now experienced both and it's 100% true. But God will get you ready in the right places at the right times. For you, there is a part that is your responsibility though to protect your own heart to steward your life well right now where you are. So young woman, if you know how much God loves you, you don't degrade yourself just to impress some some guy. You won't change who you are to please anybody and you won't do things that you're uncomfortable with. Young man, you deserve to be desired as well. So I can't say it enough. Get out of the friend zone. And I just, it, it, it is what it is. I think a lot of times when dating stuff like this comes up, pastors, rightfully so, talk about how mistreated women can be. And please hear me, it's so real. But can I tell you the majority of the conversations that I have are about men that are stuck in the friend zone somewhere trying to figure out whether or not this girl is into him and he's been talking to her six months trying to figure it out. So please hear me, shoot your shot and then ghost her, stop. Stop, 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 stop. That's that's one of the greatest things I've ever said from the pulpit. You're welcome. You're welcome. But I'm I'm being honest. I'm being real. I care about where your headspace is at. I care about where your standards are. God has something healthy for you. I know the plans I has for you, says the Lord, to bless and prosper you, to give you a hope and to give you a future. If he's given you a dream to be a spouse one day, praise God, hold to it, and don't settle in the nonsense in the in-between. Work on being healthy and work on being whole. Hear me, the best thing that you can do for your future spouse is to become a whole individual. To become a just 
good, godly, Christian young person that's doing their best to figure it out. Work on doing that, and God will put all the other puzzle pieces in line at the right time. Somebody say amen. Stand to your feet around the room. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can turn to you for living water. I thank you, Lord, that we can turn to you for living water. God, for many of us, we have, we have these experiences where we did not guard our hearts well or where other people took advantage of our innocence. And God, I thank you that you are a perfect healer. And when you heal, you do it completely. So God, we declare the blood of Jesus over our lives, over our hearts, over our memories, over any PTSD, God, from trauma and bondage of the past. I thank you for complete healing and complete freedom. God, where there are wounds from abuse and from drama, I thank you that you can wash those things clean, that you are a redemptive God, that they can have a healthy marriage, that divorce may have been their parents' story, it's not gonna be theirs, that abuse may have been their past situation, but it won't be that for their kids. They get to draw new lines in the sand. They get to choose to put new boundaries in place to guard and protect their heart, to protect their future spouse's heart, to protect God, and we will make mistakes and we will slip up, but thank you that you are the ultimate source of living water. So we choose today to not look for relationships and other things to be that fulfillment. Lord, we look to you, and I ask that you will heal every area of our hearts as we navigate and move forward, Lord. God, I thank you for who you are. And I just bless these people and the families that they represent, that physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and financially, that they would be blessed and highly favored because they're your kids. Let your kingdom come and your will be done in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen.